Greetings DCS community and welcome back to my channel. Today we're in the B-47 and uh oh well there goes the engine and if you find this happens to you fairly often then this video is for you so stick around. The P-47 is a wonderfully detailed module which includes how well the engine is modeled. Today we're going to go over the various operations of the legendary Pratt & Whitney 18-cylinder R2800 double wasp radial engine uh, used here in the jug, which will include startup, takeoff, power and mixture settings for cruise, turbocharger usage, combat power, and landing. We'll also cover various things that are commonly overlooked that tend to cause problems, and also why the engine bearings seem so fragile as compared to some of the other warbirds. I'm not going to cover full operation of the jug itself, but rather focus on engine management as this is a vital skill considering that mismanaging your engine can bring down your plane just as easily as getting shot down. Warbirds are challenging to fly, but very rewarding once you get the hang of them. The P-47 is unique in that it has both an engine driven supercharger, typical for a lot of aircrafts in this era, and a turbo supercharger, which was relatively new technology at the time. The turbo supercharger is simply referred to as a turbocharger these days. Turbochargers work by capturing the thermal energy in the exhaust gas that would otherwise just be lost by going out the exhaust pipe. The exhaust gas spins a turbine that turns a compressor, which forces more air into the engine, allowing it to burn more fuel and produce more power. Given that there isn't a lot of room in a fighter aircraft, the turbocharger was remotely mounted in the fuselage near the tail, shown here in this diagram. The turbocharger itself is indirectly controlled by the wastegate, which is controlled by the boost lever in the cockpit. Now the wastegate controls how much exhaust gas was either diverted and sent overboard or sent back to the turbocharger to be used by the, uh, it, the turbine and therefore the compressor. Unlike other aircraft such as the P-51, Spitfire, Mosquito, the P-47 does not have an automatic boost pressure regulator. You, the pilot, are responsible for maintaining the manifold pressure by using the throttle and the boost lever. Key things to remember are that as you climb, your boost pressure will fall as the air gets thinner. And then the opposite happens when you descend down into thicker air. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we are in a cold and dark P-47, so let's just go ahead and uh, go through a quick startup. Uh, first things first, we want to set the parking brake. I'm actually pretty glad that this uh, aircraft has a parking brake because not all Warbirds feature this. And it's something that I find is a, is a nice uh, thing to have. All right, so find a parking brake handle, which is right here in the center of the instrument panel. So go ahead and pull and hold that. Toe brakes down and hold them down for about three seconds. Release the toe brakes, release the handle. Now if the handle stays locked out, you did it right and your parking brake is set. If it went back in, uh, you'll have to repeat the process and uh, hopefully you got it right that time. Uh, it's set, so in order to release, all we got to do is hit the toe brakes again and then it'll automatically disengage. All right, so next, main fuel valve set to the main tank. Flaps match the position of the flaps. Propeller level full forward. Ignition to on. And then next we want to prime the engine. So over here on the right hand side of the cockpit, right click to unlock. And depending on the temperature, it's a warm summer day today. So the engine will require between four and 10 shots of prime. And since it's nice and warm out today, about four will do for us today. So. Now here's a critical step, and those new to the jug tend to overlook this, but once you prime the engine, you have to relock the primer handle uh, by right-clicking it again. And what this does for you is closes off all the valves in the primer assembly so that the engine can't draw any extra fuel. Uh, through that, that does not go through the carburetor, or in other words, if you forget to lock this, your engine's going to run funny. All right, last step here before we turn the battery on is to look outside and check that the cowl flaps are open. And there's no indication here in the cockpit. You just got to look out the window and just look up front. Um, I will point out that any ground start, no matter the outside temperature, these need to stay open. Your engine will not warm up any faster if you leave these uh, closed. So 
they, they stay open. All right, next we turn on the battery, which is located here on the left side of the instrument panel. And we see the gauges start to come alive, meaning we got good power. Uh, next, now that we have power, we got to set the intercooler and oil cooler doors, which you can see their position on this indicator right here in the left-hand wall. Oil cooler is the one here at the top. The intercooler is down here at the bottom. Now, the switches are backwards from that. So the intercooler is the top switch for the bottom in indicator, and the oil cooler is the bottom switch for the top indicator. I do not know why the P47 was designed that way, but it made sense to somebody, and it's what we're stuck with. So, regardless, we're just going to go ahead and set these. Neutral. And neutral. All right, we're good to go there. All right, next, we crack the throttle about an inch. And locate our starter switch right here on the panel. So this is an inertia type starter, uh, which means that the starter motor has to spin up the speed first before we can engage it and crank the engine. The first thing we gotta do though is set the motor brushes. So to do so, you right click very briefly and set the brushes. And then you left click and hold to get the motor spinning uh, for about 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, while that's doing that, I'm gonna point out the Mixture control, which is currently in the idle cutoff position. Uh, when we crank the engine and it fires, what we want to do is send this knob, this lever, to the auto ritz position right here. So we got to be ready to do that as soon as the engine uh, comes to life. So spend about the right amount of time. So right click, crank the engine. All right. And then right away, you want to look at your oil pressure gauge. Make sure you get a rise in your oil pressure. That looks good. All right, now RPM gauge. And set for about 900 RPM for warm-up. Now, just go over some of the engine gauges real quick. We got the carburetor air temperature. That comes in real handy for whenever we're running at higher power levels. The turbocharger RPM gauge, which is right here. Your triple gauge, which has oil temperature on the top oil pressure on the left and fuel pressure on the right. Down here you have the cylinder head temperature. That's a direct readout of how hot the engine is running. Engine RPM. Manifold pressure, which is measuring the air pressure inside the intake manifold. Uh, fuel. Water pressure for whenever you're doing water injection, which I'll cover later. Suction gauge that's coming off the engine to drive some of your instruments. And then over here on the far left, you have the generator gauge. So the generator doesn't do anything at low RPM. It just doesn't have enough speed in order to run anything. But we do want to make sure it's turned on. So that's this last switch higher on the bottom of the switch panel. So generator on, nothing. And then lastly, you got hydraulic pressure right here, which is in the green. And now that we have pressure, we can bring the flaps up. Looks good. Now. Until the cylinder head temperature is 100 degrees and you get good oil pressure, which we have good pressure now, but until this reaches 100 degrees, you're not to exceed 1,000 RPM. Now, this is an air-cooled engine, so it, it actually warms up fairly quick uh, as compared to something like the, the Mustang and the Spitfire with both of them being water-cooled. What you don't want to do is, like I said, you don't want to exceed 1,000 RPM. But, however, if you're on good level ground like this, uh, you are able to taxi at around 900 RPM and just underneath that. So uh, you can taxi to the runway while warming up your engine as long as you're on good ground. A uh, couple things here. Like I want to point out back here on the, the mixture controls, we have a couple positions. Idle cutoff, which shuts off fuel to the engine and shuts it down. Auto lean, which is uh, which I'll cover later in, uh, when we get to crew settings. Auto rich, which is normal for our ground operations. And then you got this last position called full rich. Full rich is the position, it's an emergency position in case of a carburetor failure or the carburetor gets damaged in combat. And what this does is it allows fuel to bypass the carburetor and gets uh, fed into the engine at a fixed rate. It burns more fuel because it's not regulated like it would be through the carburetor. And it, the engine will run funny up at altitude because it's getting metered in at a specific rate. It is there 
to keep your engine running so you can make it home while also uh, descending down to a lower altitude where the engine will run normal. But like I said, your fuel burn will be a lot higher in full rich. And it's, like I said, it's meant for an emergency position to help get you home. Uh, lastly, uh, right here on the end of the throttle, I've got this little button here. It's not the microphone switch. And what that is, is the water injection switch. So I'll cover that whenever we get into uh, high power settings. But there's two controls for it you get uh, in the, in the uh, key bindings. You have one position to, to turn on and off the switch which it has to be held down the entire time if you're using it that way. And it was like that in the jug in real life as well. So as long as you're holding the button down and you're at a sufficient power level, water will get squirted into the engine intake and uh, help cool things down. Now, instead of having to hold this button the entire time, what you can do is once it's down is slide it forward and lock it with a separate control. And it'll stay engaged for as long as that is in that position. And then to get it back to turn that off, you just hit the, uh, the lock button a second time. So takeoff is pretty straightforward in the jug. Uh, your levers need to be set as follows. Make sure to auto rich, propeller full forward, throttle as needed, and then boost lever full aft. Uh, your cow flaps need to be closed in about halfway so and that is controlled with this silver knob right here underneath the primer so push in on that control and bring the cow flaps in about halfway that looks about right so we'll leave them there uh, if you forget those and leave them wide open what happens is the airflow over the nose gets disrupted and that is felt back here at the tail so shortly after takeoff your aircraft is going to start shaking and that's because of that disrupted airflow going over the tail. So if that happens to you, the first thing I would do is stick my head up and look at the cow flaps and make sure that those are um, retracted in part, uh, at least halfway. All right, so once we're lined up and we got our tail wheel locked like it is now, and that handle needs to be f uh, face forward, what we're going to do is stand on the brakes and I'll talk through these next steps here. So what we're gonna do is bring the throttle up to 30 inches manifold pressure and hold it there. Uh, your brakes are strong enough that they will hold the aircraft still at this power setting. So what we're looking for, carburetor air temperature looks good, no RPM on the turbo, oil temperature is a little high, but that's because I'm standing still. Oil pressure looks great, cylinder heads look good, RPM is stable, hydraulic pressure is good. Uh, look over here to the generator and we notice that it is no longer on zero. That's because we have enough engine speed that the generator actually can do its job. All right, everything's look good. Now at this point, uh, you would release the brakes and commit to takeoff. So I'm just gonna talk through that part real quick so it's not too loud in here uh, with the engine. Once you release the brakes, you would increase the throttle slowly and smoothly to full power while also feeding in some right rudder. Uh, that's to help keep you straight going down the runway. Uh, when you're able, usually between 50 and 75 miles an hour, you need to raise the tail up off the ground. Now, unlike a lot of the other fighters where you would go nose level, you don't do that in a jug. Uh, that's mostly because this thing is swinging a 14 foot diameter propeller and it is really easy to nose over too far and either have a prop strike or go nose over all the way and lead to a crash. All right, for most takeoffs, the supercharger alone it will give you enough power so you can get to jug airborne. Now, for some situations, uh, you can bring in the turbocharger and also water injection if needed to supplement that and increase your power. Uh, things like a heavy loadout, uh, hot and humid conditions, short runways or a combination of those could warrant using the turbo and water injection. Uh, what you would do in that case is on your takeoff roll you would bring this uh, throttle up to full power and then uh, bring in the boost lever as needed so you can get your manifold pressure up and produce more po engine power. Now there's a couple of lines marked off on the gauge here. 52 inches is the maximum manifold pressure allowed without using water injection. That's as high as you can go. 
And then the second red line here at 64, that's the highest permitted period while using water injection. So you gotta be careful and, and take a glance at that if you're using those higher power settings on your takeoff roll. Because as you gain airspeed going down the runway, you're gonna get some ram air effect going down the intake and that will naturally start rising on you because of that. So you gotta, you gotta glance down and uh, keep that in check. Which remember, this thing does not have an automatic boost pressure regulator like I had mentioned. Once you're airborne, you get the landing gear up and get your airspeed. Um, you, don't, you don't do any sort of steep climbs, just enough to clear obstacles if you need, but you're kinda gonna either be leveled off or slightly above level and you're gonna get your airspeed up to about 160 for your best climb. Uh, bring your boost lever back if you used it for your takeoff. And then you would uh, reduce your manifold pressure down to 42 inches and then bring your RPM back to 2550 in that sequence. Uh, to, and that setting of 2550 and 42 inches is the settings for maximum continuous power. That's the setting that will allow this engine the highest power setting and it can run all day at that setting as long as you keep feeding it fuel and then finally once you're leveled off and you're above 200 miles an hour uh, that's when you can close your cow flaps the rest of the way all right so let's uh take our off active pause and see what this looks like so brakes engaged and i'm going to talk through the rest of it so bring it up to 30 inches RPM stable, oil pressure's good, carburetor's good, hydraulics, cylinder heads, generator, everything looks good. All right, so I'm gonna to commit to takeoff now, release the brakes, right rudder, and, and smoothly bring the power up to full. And now my sole focus is mostly outside the window by keeping this thing straight. Airspeed's alive, I just glanced down at that. Bring the nose down slightly. Control, control. Easy does it, easy does it. 110. Alright, we're airborne, gear up. Alright, gear lights out. We're at best climb, 160. Now we bring the manifold pressure back. And 2550. And we can go ahead and control, we can close the canopy. That's actually one thing that was in the, the flight manuals for these, that uh, you did all your takeoffs and ground operations with the, the canopy open. You only closed it once you got up at, uh, once you got airborne. All right, 200, and now we're gonna close the cow flaps the rest of the way. And there they go. And there's your takeoff. Well, one last thing you wanna do is open your intercooler to wide open once you're airborne. Uh, unless it's cold outside, in which case you can keep it set to neutral. Uh, the oil cooler doors can stay in neutral for the most part, but you want to keep an eye on your oil temperature gauge, which in my case looks a little high, so I'm going to open that a little bit. And it's already starting to fall back down into the safe range, so I'm just going to leave that. So, and this is all part of uh, flying a warbird. You need to keep an eye, you need to pay attention to what your engine's doing so that keep it happy and uh, keep you alive long enough during your mission to uh, one. Now there's only a few things to go over for crews, but one of the most important is the correct technique for increasing and decreasing power. Uh, this is also good practice in the other DCS Warbirds. Now in flight, your throttle will control your manifold pressure, like so. And then your uh, propeller lever uh, controls your RPM directly. Now here in the P-47 and the P-51, manifold pressure was uh, measured in inches of mercury. Uh, in the English aircraft, like the Mosquito and the Spitfire, uh, that gauge is marked off in pounds per square inch, or PSI. Uh, the German aircraft are units of atmosphere, but regardless of which aircraft uh, that you're flying, the process is the same. When you need to increase power, you first bring up the RPM as needed and then bring up the manifold pressure. And it's the opposite for decreasing power. Reduce the manifold pressure first, and then bring down the RPM if needed. Uh, doing it this way keeps the cylinder pressures within limits and prevents any undue stress or damage to the engine. 
uh, for the intercooler and the oil cooler doors here. Uh, once you're in flight, so once you're off the ground, you want the intercooler to be wide open and you just pretty much just set it there the whole flight. And then your oil cooler uh, can stay in neutral, but that's something you got to keep an eye on here at the temperature gates is starting to creep up on me so I'm going to open that a little bit and you can already see it's starting to fall so again that part of flying these warbirds is managing your engine so you gotta you gotta take a peek at your gauges every couple of minutes to do this if you're familiar with either the p51 or even the tf51 trainer that comes packaged within DCS uh, you may have noticed and I mentioned this earlier that there's this auto lean setting what does that do for us? Uh, what Auto Lean does is it sets the carburetor uh, into a different uh, fuel air mixture setting so that in cruise flight, you'll actually burn less fuel and not only burn less fuel, but also greatly extend your both your time you can stay airborne and also your useful range. Uh, it does come at a cost as you can only use this mode at low power, uh, lower power settings. And a quick reference for this, get my head in the right position. A quick reference for when you can use auto lean are these colored arcs on both the manifold pressure and the engine RPM gauge. Uh, the green signifies uh, your cruise power settings for auto rich, and the blue is where you can use it for auto lean. Now, with that both needles have to be within the blue range in order to use auto lean. If you do have to bring the power back up outside of the blue arcs, you have to first remember to go to auto rich before you bring the power up. Uh, if you're running longer missions, I do recommend you become familiar with these settings. Uh, like I said, your endurance and your useful range will go up. So as before, so if I wanted to shift into auto lean, uh, bring back the manifold pressure first when you're reducing get that into the blue and then now you can bring down the RPM as needed Both within the blue And now I can shift that into uh, auto lean uh, You're not going to have any indication of fuel flow in the jug. However It's there in auto lean and uh, your fuel tank is going to be a little bit happier and then let's say if we did get bounced by fighters and I need to bring the power up, bring that up to auto rich, RPM up first, and then bring the power up. And that's all there is to it. Now take a look at this chart here and you can see that there is a substantial reduction in fuel consumption by running an auto lean when you can. Uh, you can also see here that the R2800 is a very thirsty engine at high power settings. Uh, this chart was made use, using data obtained from the DCS P47 flight manual, as well as real life P47 flight manuals and the R2800 engine manual. A uh, link to this handy chart will be in the description below. I mentioned earlier you can use the turbo for takeoff, but what about other phases of flight? Uh, a reminder that the P47 does not have an automatic boost pressure regulator. That job falls solely on you as the pilot and with these levers down here. At low altitude, you do not want to run the turbocharger at all. Uh, the supercharger that's being driven by the engine is usually more than sufficient for most of your power demands at low altitudes. If you try to bring in the turbo at, low, at lower altitudes, what you end up doing is using the turbo, but you end up having to pull back on the throttle to keep the manifold pressure in check. And what that does is give you a double penalty. Uh, you end up burning more fuel because you're still driving the engine it, to get the turbocharger to, to have enough thermal energy at the turbine to spin in. But at the same time, you're bottlenecking both the turbo and the supercharger with a partially closed throttle. And with that, you can take up to a 300 horsepower penalty by running it in that condition. So you generally want, if you're going to use the turbo, this usually should be as full forward as you can and then bring the turbo up to supplement and get your boost pressure back to where you need it. Uh, minimum altitude for using the turbo by the flight manual is 7,000 feet. Recommended altitude is 12,000 feet. 
Now above 12,000 is really where the turbo starts to help and you can see us up here at 15,000 feet. I'm using about uh, just under half of the capability of the turbo to get my uh, manifold pressure back to where it needs to be for maximum continuous power. As you're flying around, you definitely want to keep an eye on everything that's here because remember as you climb, this will start to fall and they, in that case you would have to increase the turbo using the, the boost lever to bring your uh, manifold pressure up. And then it's the same on the way back down. As you go, as you descend, your manifold pressure will naturally rise because you're getting into thicker air. Your, the compressors on both the turbocharger and the supercharger are more efficient and you'll end up with more air into the engine. So you gotta, you gotta manage that carefully. You always gotta be watching your engine instruments as you're flying. Up at higher altitudes, say above 20,000 feet, your throttle is already full and you can pretty much manage your engine power solely with the boost lever. Uh, whenever you're doing so, there's a few limitations. So the carburetor air temperature gauge, anytime you compress air, it gets hot and this has to stay within limits otherwise it'll lead to detonation within the engine leading to engine damage you don't want that also you got to make sure that you don't overspeed the turbo which is what this little red light will indicate off to the right of the gauge uh, 22,000 rpm is your limit on the turbocharger so you don't want to exceed that number also if you're right at the limit of 22,000 there is a 15 minute limitation for running the turbocharger that hard. Otherwise you could end up damaging the turbo. Your air limitation is 50 degrees Celsius on the carb air temperature. If you find the needle is at or above 50, there's a couple things you can do. One is to make sure that your intercooler is as open as it'll get, which it should be because you're in flight already. Now, if that's set open and you're still running hot here, you're going to have to bring back the manifold pressure to get that in check because like I said that higher temperatures here will lead to engine damage later. Now for combat operation this R2800 air-cooled engine can take a lot more punishment than the water-cooled V12s used in like the Spitfire, Mustang, and Mosquito. Uh, temperatures for this engine increase whenever we're in military power or war emergency power. Uh, your normal limitations on cylinder head is 232 degrees. That increases to 260 whenever you're at the high power settings. Uh, your limitation on carb air temperature is still 50. That doesn't change. As before, whenever we're increasing power, you bring up the RPM first. So 2700 RPM. We're at full throttle already. Now we bring in the boost pressure as needed to get to 52. right there now this is military power the engines generating about 2,000 horsepower and this is the highest power setting allowed without using water injection this setting can be used for no more than 15 minutes now if you really needed more power than this well we got you covered there too now we bring in water injection so remember this that little button on the end of the throttle and we want to look at this gauge here there's our water pressure. We're at six, 59 inches there. And what we can do is we can bring it up to 64 inches. This is the highest power setting allowed for this engine. And right now we're generating about 2,400 horsepower. Water injection is required. Otherwise you're gonna risk some severe engine damage very pretty quick because it's gonna run hot and it's gonna run hot real quick. Uh, like I said, the limitation at this power setting is no more than five minutes total. Uh, the water tank on this aircraft holds about 30 gallons of water, and that'll hold you for about 15 minutes of water injection. But like I said, this power setting, five minutes. So let's go ahead and bring it back. Bring back the manifold pressure first, and then the RPM. All right, back to max continuous, and here we go. All right, so that's combat power. Now let's talk about diving attacks, because this was an excellent ground attack uh, aircraft. For diving attacks, you want to pull back on the RPM so you don't risk overspeeding the engine on the way downhill. 
you also want to pull back on the throttle so that you do not overspeed the aircraft. Uh, you do not want to close it off all the way as this risks windmilling the engine, which is bad. We'll cover that here in a minute. Uh, you, you do want to keep some power in the dive to prevent windmilling. Uh, you want to make sure that your cowl flaps are fully closed uh, before starting your dive. Uh, lastly, uh, as far as dives go, you never enter a dive from a split S maneuver. And if you're not familiar with a split S, that is, you know, I'll take it off active pause. There we go. A split S is when you roll inverted and then pull. That's a split S. You never enter a dive from that because it's very easy to overspeed this aircraft in doing so. Uh, the, and it's actually prohibited per the flight manual for the P-47. Uh, the best way to enter a dive is you just nose over the aircraft and just keep an eye on your speeds. It picks up speed real fast, so you got to watch it. One. All right, now we're on to landing. Landing is where a lot of the DCS pilots tend to lose the engine outside of combat mostly due to main bearing damage. As a general rule, radial engines do not like to be windmilled, as this loads the crankshaft bearings the wrong way in a place where there's very little lubrication. Uh, for the nuts and bolts details on why this is, down in the video description is a link to a great article on the Eagle Dynamics Forum. Uh, to my knowledge, the P-47 is the first DCS module that models this behavior in a radial engine. Uh, I don't have the either the FW-190 or the I-16, the only other radial engine aircraft that's uh, player flyable. Uh, if you own either variants uh, of the Focke Wolf 190 or the I-16 and engine bearing damage is a thing in that aircraft, please comment below. I'd, I'd love to know if that's a thing in the other radial engine aircraft. So with the instrumentation that we have here on the jug, there's no easy way of knowing when the engine is being windmilled. All right, so how do we prevent this? Uh, luckily, there's an old pilot rule of thumb for radial engines that can be used uh, in the absence of some other gauges. And that is to use no less than one inch of manifold pressure for every 100 RPM. What this translates to at 2550 RPM is to use no less than 25 inches of manifold pressure. What this does is it ensures that the engine is always driving the prop and it's not being windmilled. Uh, when you're in the pattern for landing, your engine's generally set at 2550, and you may find it difficult to slow down for landing. This, this bird just wants to keep flying. It does not like slowing down. With practice, it is manageable, and 2550 leaves you a good power margin if you find yourself getting slow in a turn, especially on that uh, turn to final. Uh, you do not ever want to do turns less than 130 miles an hour in this, as it's very easy to stall a wing and enter a descending spiral and then end up looking like this. You may also notice that when you're on short final with your airspeed around 115 miles an hour that your RPM will start to decay and fall below your set point of 2550. That's entirely normal and that's just a function of the airspeed and operation of the propeller governor. Uh, turbocharger usage is not recommended or needed during landing, and you're at low altitude anyway, below 7,000 feet, so you're not supposed to use it anyway. Uh, so your boost lever should be full aft during your landing sequence. One of the things you can do to help slow down, I've learned, is we're at 200 miles an hour, so what we can do is uh, pull out some of the cowl flaps and get some induced drag. Uh, about halfway is sufficient. Remember, we don't want to go too far because it'll uh, start fluttering on off the tail uh, by disrupting the airflow. So, all right, let's go ahead and uh, take control and let's do a quick landing. So, 2550. And let's bring her back to 25 inches. Now, if you own the Viper, you know during uh, during landing that you can always pull some turns to help bleed some airspeed, and you can you can do that here in the jug as well, which I need to give myself some spacing off the runway anyway. So, all right, below 190, I can drop the gear. That'll help get some drag out on the airplane, and also first notch of flaps. 
So here we are, first notch. There's the runway. Need some more separation. And I see my airspeed bleeding down to about 150. All right. Turn to final. Now you really want to watch your airspeed careful. Like I said, you don't want to get below 130 in a turn because you can spiral out real quick. Forty, looking good. Green light on the landing gear, also good. Sent some more flaps down. Rudder, rudder. Let's get some more flaps down. And you want to land this thing in a three-point attitude. So crossing the fence, we should be at about 125, which we are now. Hold the nose up attitude, and you want this to pretty much stop flying on its own. Don't force the landing, otherwise, you're going to bounce. Hundred miles an hour. This thing will want to land roughly at around ninety. There we are, and then ease off the throttle. Full aft on the stick to keep that tail wheel. Uh, on the ground. You don't need the rudder anymore since you're not pulling any torque on the engine and you can ease on to the brakes. Alright, 900 RPM for ground ops. And, well, there you have it. I hope you learn uh, more on handling the engine in the P47. Uh, I have a feeling this will also be useful in the future as the F4U Corsair is still under development by Magnitude 3 Simulations as a future module for DCS. Uh, the parallel here being that the Corsair also uses the same uh, Pratt & Whitney R2800 radial engine. Uh, big difference though is that the Corsair never used a turbocharger. It, used a uh, two-speed supercharger, which is uh, fairly typical for a lot of other fighters. And with that, uh, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.